Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turner. I hope that you're doing well. I hope you're having a good week. Uh, earlier this week I finished reading Kane by Gene Toomer. I wanted to do a video just sort of exploring what an astonishing book this is. In some ways it's the advent of the Harlem Renaissance in terms of fiction. It is an extremely experimental novel. It is, uh, it's, it's a modernist work. And as with, you know, so many of the modernist works, it is, it's a book that is pushing at, you know, Toomer's pushing at what he regards the limits of language in terms of trying to explore human consciousness, uh, human identity and experience. So he, he's, he's engaging in that. Uh, it's incredibly polyphonic. The different characters very much have different voices. Um, and, and what appear to be sketches assume a much uh, more cohesive whole and a book that, that has very distinct arcs to the extent that Toomer actually had like arcs sketched almost as like frontispieces to the different sections of the book. Um, and so there, there are these, these themes he's exploring, but even beyond all of those, Toomer is really trying to take language and see are there ways in which language can be used to actually create a culture. And what he regards as this new culture that he's almost the, the forerunner of, uh, this new you know American culture, United States culture, uh, that can be created by black Americans as they sort of emerge from the horrors, the traumas, the shadow of you know segregation in the Jim Crow laws, not just in the southeastern United States where portions of the book are set, but also really across the United States um, in northern and urban settings as well. And so the book is, is really trying to advance all these ideas in just, you know, this edition uh, was 150 pages, other editions sometimes are, you know, 120 pages. So it's extremely short and yet it is such an incisive, uh, you know, book that is, is just digging right into the reader's mind and, and really forcing us to um, examine so many ideas, not just in, in our, our own consciousness, but really trying to explore who these characters are, what their experiences are. Um, as I said, the book is really experimental. It was published in 1923 and portions of it had already been published in different um, like literary magazines or uh, uh, sort of like political magazines. And, but it is not just a series, it's not just a story cycle, it's not just a, a series of sketches and vignettes or, or with poems interspersed. It really is a book that is having the, this clear arc and it also is, you know, the poems are, are built in almost to act as a rhythm and to provide either a, a sort of like um, coda to what happened and an amplification of a theme or to provide a counterpoint to, to a story or a theme. And they're woven together just so well. So as an example from the first section, most of which is set in more rural settings of, of the southeastern United States um, and what experiences would be like there. Uh, black reapers with the sound of steel on stones are sharpening sides. I see them place the hones in their hip pockets as a thing that's done and start their silent swinging one by one. Black horses drive a mower through the weeds and there a field rat startled squealing bleeds. His belly close to ground. I see the blade blood stained continue cutting weeds and shade. And that is followed by November cotton flower bull weevils coming and the winter's cold. Made cotton stocks look rusty, seasons old, and cotton, scarce as any southern snow, was vanishing, the branch so pinched and slow, failed in its function as the autumn rake, drought-fighting soil had caused the soil to take. All water from the streams, dead birds were found, in wells a hundred feet below the ground. Such was the season when the flower bloomed. Old folks were startled, and it soon assumed. Significance, superstition saw, something it had never seen before. Brown eyes that loved without a trace of fear. Beauty so sudden for that time of year. And so two poems, each with a rural setting, are set, in, you know, juxtaposed beside each other. One, this almost careless industrial view, um, and, and Toomer had explored, you know, uh, concepts around socialism and communism and, and sort of radical politics, uh, looking at how much humanity had been degraded um, and not specifically just like racially degraded but how many you know there was oppression in other ways as well uh, and so he, he juxtaposes that with the the you know field mouse that has been killed and then he starts November cotton flower as this dark drought it's, you know it's really quite scary and then suddenly it ends with brown eyes that loved without a trace of fear beauty so sudden for that time of year and that's what happens throughout this book. It is not just a book exploring the horrors of, of life uh, and the horrors, uh, you know, the experiences of black Americans as they were dealing with very real, very entrenched racism. It's also a book that, you know, Toomer wants to provide experiences of 
black Americans who are living, who are having fun, who have lives and, and agency and not just dreams that are, are crushed and suppressed, but dreams that do get to flower at times. And so seeing that full panorama of experience is really one of the more amazing aspects of Kane. Um, it's it's you know it's a it's a book that really tries to achieve all of that does it always achieve it not necessarily but it's it's a strong it's a very strong work um as an example within sort of the middle sections then there are uh stories that are and, and scenes that are set in uh more urban areas and tumor had experiences uh taking different you know courses both in chicago at the university of chicago uh up he did some like a semester in wisconsin he took some courses in New York City. So he, he had different experiences in different urban areas of the North um, and had also spent time as like a substitute principal in Georgia. He spent a lot of time with his grandfather who had been um, a the black governor of Louisiana during reconstruction, Governor Pinchback. He spent time at his grandparents or his uncle's house in Washington, DC. So he had all these different experiences and he tries to fit those in in different pieces across Kane. Uh, John, stage door, uh, no, here we go, sorry. Music starts, the song is somewhere where it will not strain the leading lady's throat. The dance is somewhere where it will not strain the girls. Above the staleness, one dancer throws herself into it, Doris. John sees her, her hair crisp curled as bobbed. Bushy, black hair bobbing about her lemon colored face. Her lips are curiously full and very red. Her limbs in silk purple stockings are lovely. John, stage door Johnny, chorus girl, no, that would be all right. Dicty, educated, stuck-up, showgirl. Yep, her suspicion would be stronger than her passion. It wouldn't work. Keep her loveliness. Let her go. Doris sees John and knows that he is looking at her. Her own glowing is too rich a thing to let her feel the slimness of his deluded passion. Who's that? She asks her dancing partner. The manager's brother, Dicty. Nothing doing, hon. Doris tosses her head and dances for him until she feels she has him. Then, withdrawing disdainfully, she flirts with the director. Uh... And so we, we see the, these scenes and we see like descriptions and, and characters who speak, uh, you know, and, and they, they have these like casual ways of speaking and yet their consciousness sometimes mirrors that, sometimes it doesn't. And it's really fascinating how uh, Tumor really tries to, and I think in many ways achieves a real sense of uh, polyphonic like, like consciousness and dialogue across the different characters. So scenes that are set in the uh, southeastern U.S. sound very different from those set in the north. Um, even the slang that is employed uh, in, you know, at a campfire in one place is not the slang that is employed in a dance hall. And it's really interesting how Tumor weaves these very subtle changes across. Uh, it's also just interesting that each of them <laughs> refers to the other as Dicty, which was sort of a slang term for uh, someone who is elitist. Like, like, um, <laughs> uh, and so it continues. And this is how this, that uh, sketch ends. Doris dances. The pianist uh, crashes a bumper cord. The whole stage claps. Doris, fl Doris, flushed, looks quick at John. His whole face is in shadow. She seeks for her dance in it. She finds it a dead thing in the shadow, which is his dream. She rushes from the stage, falls down the steps into her dressing room, pulls her hair, her eyes over a floor of tears, stare at the whitewashed ceiling. Smell of dry paste and paint and soiled clothing. Her pal comes in. Doris flings herself into the old safe arms and cries bitterly. I told you nothing doing is what Mim says to comfort her. And so we, we have this experience where it seems like a, a rush of actions as sentences, but we also have a sense of <laughs> what Doris is thinking at the beginning of that and then what she smells when she runs into her dressing room. And so they, they, they intrude as sentences uh, that just force themselves into this series of actions in just a, in an interesting way. Uh, and then that piece is followed where we see a couple that maybe could have fallen in love and been successful and, and sort of achieved the dreams that each of them were seeing, you know, have lost. That passage is followed with a poem, Her Lips Are Copper Wire. Whisper of yellow globes, gleaming on lampposts that sway, like bootleg liquor drinkers in the fog, and let your breath be moist against me, like bright beads on yellow globes. Telephone the powerhouse that the main wires are insulate. Her words play softly up and down, dewy corridors of billboards. Then with your tongue, remove the tape and press your lips to mine till they are incandescent. And so we have like this extremely passionate poem uh, using imagery of like electrification and mind you, electric, you know, the electrification of cities had occurred, but certainly not in, you know, Sparta, Georgia. 
uh, to the extent that that the tumor is describing here, uh, and, and he's using that imagery to to give this scene of passion, and it's just fascinating the way his mind works, the way he truly is trying to draw on so many different experiences, and then weave them together into this whole showing all of these different experiences. And so one last section, and I had mentioned like the 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 dialogue, the way characters speak across the book changes, and so here's an example of one that is utterly different from the two uh, John and Doris who were in the dance hall. I came back to tell you, to shake your hand and tell you that you are wrong, that something beautiful is going to happen, that the gardens are purple like a bed of roses would be at dusk, that I came into the gardens, into life in the gardens with one whom I did not know, that I danced with her and did not know her, that I felt passion, contempt, and passion for her, her whom I did not know, that I thought of her, that my thoughts were matches thrown into a dark window, and all the while, the gardens were purple like a bed of roses would be at dusk. I came back to tell you, brother, that white faces are petals of roses, that dark faces are petals of dusk, that I am going out and gather petals, that I am going out and know her whom I brought here with me to these gardens, which are purple like a bed of roses would be at dusk. Paul and the black men shook hands. Um, and so that speech is, is utterly different from what we were having in a, in a prior story that also was said, you know, this is that uh, Bono and Paul, is a story that ends really, you know, with a conversation outside of a, of a dance club. And so um, Tumor, is, it's fascinating. And then you can see here on the next page how you can see sort of the arcs that are used uh, to show, hey, this is a new section now of the book King. Um, and so it, it's a really interesting book. It's a fascinating book. It, uh, it's a book that shows numerous characters who are trying to reach and aspire to a dream. And sometimes it, sometimes it ends but at other times, it's left very ambiguous for us. And there's a sense that Toomer was really viewing this as, as the first of several works that would show um, characters, you know, reaching some being crushed, but others reaching it and still reaching at the end. We don't know that they're going to achieve that, those dreams, but they're reaching. Uh, and that's where he leaves us with Cain, and that he was moving forward then into a new cycle where he would have characters who were finding that and achieving it, and that he was sort of... Um, Having drawn on his experiences for Cain to a certain degree, he was then going to achieve that himself and would, would, would write the book showing what he had achieved, showing characters what he had achieved. And as he, as he ended up ultimately writing just this one book, there's this sense of, um, of ambiguity of characters who don't quite uh, grab the ideal that Toomer was himself you know, pushing for in Cain. And I think that sometimes can, it, it can feel... Um, that, that, that ultimately the book doesn't quite show the triumphs uh, to, to um, counterbalance the tragedies that it's showing in stories like uh, Karma, uh, Karantha, uh, Karantha, Becky, certainly Becky, um, and, and some of the poems that deal very seriously and, and darkly with the realities of, of human beings lynched um, and, uh, in, in fairly graphic detail. So if that is something that is, is, an, is an experience, you know, that, that you know you don't want to read about. Um, Cain does include that, and I want to make that clear. But it, it really is, is a book that is, is trying to show how full of life um, uh, life can be uh, for, for black Americans uh, in the 1910s and 1920s, um, and not just in the North, but in the South as well. So it's, it's a fascinating book. Now, there is some controversy around Toomer, around ideas that he was later trying to pass, that he and he he very he he was outspoken about saying I don't want this book to be advertised and published as you know a a, a colored book or a Negro book um, and it was and he uh, really pushed against that. There's a real sense of he was trying to exist in and Zinzi Clemens points this out in in uh, forward to this edition of Penguin Classics that similar to the way there were a lot of people in the U.S. who said, oh, maybe we've moved beyond race and we, the, we have this like post-racial society, uh, particularly after the election of President Obama in 2008 um, and his inauguration, that this, there's this hope that we've moved into a post-racial society, that Toomer was sort of like a, a, a one-man voice in the wilderness trying to create that himself and that he felt that he could not just be defined by race and that he had all these other experiences that he was drawing on. Um, uh, so th there's some controversy around that. Both the both Hutchinson in an introduction and Clemens in the foreword kind of point out that a corrective to that that Toomer was trying to 
define a new culture and he was also still speaking in Harlem giving lectures he you know friends and colleagues viewed his, uh, his family as black um, viewed him as black uh, and that while he wouldn't necessarily go and identify out you know in an outspoken way that way he would allow others to identify him that way um, and so there's controversy around that but I don't think it I don't think it should hinder what Kane accomplishes um, so I read it in the Penguin Classic Edition, but if you are a fan of the Harlem Renaissance, I would be remiss in pointing out that the Library of America has this amazing Harlem Renaissance collection, of which Kane, as I mentioned, it's kind of like the first work of fiction in the Renaissance, is the first work in the uh, five novels of the 1920s edition, which also just has an exquisite cover. Um, there, and Toomer was very, owned the influence that there are aspects of Kane where it's very clear that Toomer has read Winesburg, Ohio by Sherwood Anderson and is, is, you know, good artist copy, great artist steal. So he's, he's pulling some, some ideas from here. Um, he also apparently read the plays of Bernard Shaw, George Bernard Shaw, which I hadn't realized. Um, and then as I learned that I went, that explains them. So within Kane, there are sections that are poems. There are sections that are like very short, quick sketches. There are sections that are full stories. Within some of the stories, there are sections that are essentially dialogue between two characters uh, in a dramatic form. And so it, it's very modern. It's very experimental. Uh, but as I read that, I, I understood the connection. Um, I mentioned, you know, uh, the polyphonic nature of it. David Peace's GB84 accomplishes that in a, in a very similar way. It also deals with real tragedies in a very similar way. Um, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway does that as well, where the characters just feel so distinct, so different. Their consciousness, their dialogue, all of it is just encompassing. These are separate individuals. Um, and Toomer does that in just a very compact little book. Uh, there are ways in which it certainly feels influenced by James Weldon Johnson's Autobiography of the Next Colored Man. And also some of the stories of Charles Chestnut, where Chestnut in a similar way was trying to, to push at this idea of, um, of how, do, how do we work through and, and, and work out of segregation. Um, and then I've also been reading the Penguin Book of Modern African Poetry, and it's interesting how the fire and the passion uh, that Toomer fuses with beauty in his poetry is reflected in uh, many of the poems in this book. And I want to close with a quick reading from the Portable Harlem Renaissance reader, a poet who ha was really a collaborator with Toomer, was Georgia Douglas Johnson. Let me not lose my dream, even though I scan the veil, with eyes unseeing through their glaze of tears. Let me not falter, though the rungs of fortune perish, as I fare above the tumult, praying purer air. Let me not lose the vision, gird me, powers that toss the worlds I pray. Hold me in guard, lest anguish tear my dreams away. And that almost could be a poem written to or about Gene Toomer in some ways, as he uh, really w was trying to create something new and left us with, with a really amazing book that I highly recommend everyone read. Let me know if you've read it. Let me know if there's other books it reminded you of. And uh, again, I hope you're having a great week.